Hello everyone who joined the conference, the material body of the book, Between Tradition and Innovation. I'm Yeva Plekiena, the researcher of the Art Research Institute at uh, Vilnius Academy of Arts, and I'm gonna to moderate this uh, session, which is called Printed Book Within the Styles of Art. It consists of four presentations, and you are welcome to ask questions by writing them in the bar at the bottom of the screen. Speakers will answer them during uh, the discussion time at the end of the session after all presentations. And now I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Joanna uh, Sikorska, an art historian and chief curator of the Department of Prints and Drawings at the National Museum of Warsaw and a lecturer at the Institute of uh, Art History at the University of Warsaw. Her research interests focus on Italian and German graphic art, in particular on the reception of prints in the 15th and 16th centuries. And her topic today is the book as editorial dilemma, the aesthetic perspective of Renaissance public publishers in Krakow. Joanna, it's your floor. Hello, greetings from Warsaw. Here is my presentation. In the early modern era, writings on art there were a rarity in the Kingdom of Poland. This makes the preserved texts even more precious as they offer an insight into what was expected of art and what was believed to be its purpose. Interestingly, among the authors of this few reflections on art, there are quite a few publishers who, similarly to many eminent representatives of this profession in other countries, were often excellently educated, had a broad spectrum of interest, and were very well connected with the highest elite. It goes without saying that more was expected of art of the book than of simple representation that were not meant to illustrate a specific text. The challenges that printing houses and first and foremost publishers had to face were recounted in numerous commentaries they often left in volumes published in the 16th century in Krakow, the then captive Poland. These texts demonstrate the publisher exceptional awareness of intricacies of the profession dedicated to the art of book, including its technical, artistic, commercial and intellectual aspects. The prefaces, dedication and afterwords they wrote for the works published in the printing houses were often very personal and they constitute an excellent proof of their knowledge of various periods of pictorial resemblance and functions of depictions. In this paper, I would like to focus on the attitude of two major publishers active in Krakow in the second half of the 16th century, Mikołaj Scharfenberger and Jan Januszowski. It needs to be emphasized that both of them were born into established families of printers and as a result, they were exceptionally well prepared to editorial work and had an unparalleled understanding of the profession's intricacies. The first and very critical comment regarding illustration can be found in the most prestigious publication to come out of the printing house run by the Schattenbergers, a family of printers and publishers originated from Silesia. In the Bible published in 1561 by Marek Scharfenberger's first printing house, there was a brief apology for the unsatisfactory quality of illustrations. Uh, this Bible was the first Roman Catholic edition of the entire Holy Scripture in the Polish language and the aforementioned apology read as follows, quote, 
kind reader, do not be offended that not uniform are the figures set in this Bible. That is, that some are larger and some are smaller. End of quote. This inconsistency in the size of illustration in the Schaffenberger Bible resulted from the use of a heterogeneous set of woodblocks. Some of them had been cut as early as the 30s to illustrate the Luther Bible published by Hans Luft Printing House in Wittenberg. However, reusing printing matrices originally produced for other publications was standard practice at the time. Therefore, it's not clear why Nikolai Schaffenberger, whose name is signed under the power, felt the need to apologize for the form of illustration. The main reason might have been his understanding of the role of this edition of the Bible. It was published during the period of fierce religious dispute and constitutes the Roman Catholic response to Protestant texts issued in Polish. The Schaffenberger Bible revealed the full extent of the debate about the role of illustration. Publishers in Krakow had to face the fact that woodblock images had transgressed the simple illustrative purpose, turning into an important vector of content and ideas. Thus, it became necessary to avoid the risk of sending contradictory messages. Meanwhile, some of the illustrations in the this mentioned Roman Catholic Bible were printed using woodblocks made for the Luther Bible, which contain explicitly anti papal things, and this had to be removed, meaning that the woodblocks had to be censored. Such confessional alteration of illustration were, were quite frequent at the time, and it was a reflection of the pragmatic approach of publishers who wanted to secure very costly undertakings and an illustrated edition of the entire scripture was by all means one of them, and still clear from any clashes with the church and secular censors. In not, it cannot be excluded, however, that the apology in the foreword in the Schaffenberger Bible was an attempt to reduce any questions regarding the illustration to merely formal issues connected with the then common practice of reusing printing matrices, while the actual problem, at the time still a new one in Krakow, was the conflict of creeds which explored the argumentative potential of imagery. Interestingly, in the second edition of the Schaffenberger Bible, published under different political and religious circumstances in 1575 and containing even more heterogeneous illustrative material, the critical passage on illustrations was omitted. Adversely, the title of the publication was modified and the importance of illustration was stressed by the added words, quote, adorned with figures. This critical approach to illustrations reappeared in another publication of the Schaffenberger's printing house, namely in the Herbal, that is a description of local, foreign and overseas herbs by Martin Schenning, published in 1568. The publisher, in his dedication to Jan Herbal, described the behind-the-scenes circumstances of the book publication, stressing his altruistic motives. His intention was to provide readers with a handbook of the most recent developments in the field of medicine and preparation of remedies, but he had to abandon this ambitious plan and publish, uh, of publishing, sorry, he had to uh, abandon this ambition plan uh, of publishing a fully original work due to financial constraints. Quote, I was unable to find a man 
skilled enough and willing to do this work. And even if I had found one, my modest fortune would not have been enough to build this expenditure, especially if images of the herbs were to be depicted anew. I was forced to put this venture aside since, as I have said, it required a great sum of money that I could not afford. End of quote. In those times, finding a qualified woodcutter was a common problem among publishers in many circles. Even in the case of the most prestigious publication, it was not easy to employ a skilled form schneider. Without an expert craftsman, work was often delayed or, as it happened in this case, publishers had to rely on illustration made for earlier publications. This method allowed to resolve another major issue that was also mentioned in this foreword, namely that cutting a large set of wooden printing blocks was considerable expenditure. Mindful of the profit, the publisher were, on the one hand, trying to avoid excessive spending, but on the other, they readily floated the expenses. Hence, this money-saving paradigm was a recurring theme in the forwards and dedications. This reflected, to a certain extent, the realities of the publishing market at the time, where editors often walked in a thin line between success and bankruptcy, and their fate depended on a host of economic, social, political, and artistic factors. One can even say that financial difficulties were an inseparable part of the history of early printing, printing houses. What was quite original in the foreword to Marcin Schimnik Herbas was the use of the word Wykonterfetowane, an archaic Polish word meaning depicted, to denote the making of the images of plants in this publication. In the Renaissance, the Latin term contrafacere gained popularity in many national languages and its semantic scope was not limited to the simple crafting of an image, as it also suggested the message carried by the image was in fact objective, consistent with nature, and even true. The popularity of this term indicates that there existed a need to describe the new functions and form of images, in which the decisive factor was very authenticity. Naturally, the use of the term wykonterpretować alone cannot allow us to assume that Scharfenberger was well versed in Renaissance theories of mimetic art or in the vast subject of similarity and imitation. However, as a publisher who had already published one Herbert in 1556, he must have been aware of specific expectation from authors and readers alone regarding illustration of texts that were uh, uh, or aspired to be scholarly, such a Renaissance herbus. Two things were important here. First, accuracy of the information they communicated, and the already mentioned precise depiction of the nature that allowed to unmistakably identify the described and depicted plants. Leading, leading publication of this genre exemplify the importance attached to the quality of illustration. For instance, the very title of the famous book by Otto Bunfels, illustrated by Hans Weiditz, published in 1530 in Strasbourg by Johannes Schott, Herbarum vive Icones, indicates that lifelike images of plants were a key feature of this handbook. It cannot be ruled out that when Scharfenberger was writing his forward, he had in mind illustration found in other works published at the time. In this text, he referenced 
to Pietro Mattioli and his achievements in medicine, proving by the same token that he was well acquainted with the novelties of the publishing market. The contrast between illustration adorning book published in his time and woodcuts in his own publication, where some prints blocks were used more than once to depict several plants, may have prompted him to justify himself in the eyes of his readers. A reflection on this text, supported by the analysis of the illustration, leads to conclusion that these complaints were not a mere convention or a demonstration of the author's modesty. They should be perceived as a sign of growing awareness of complex role of illustrative material and of understanding the various functions of images that went beyond simply adding a visual layer to the text. It seems plausible that such critical remarks were inspired by comparisons with the achievements of foreign printing houses. Even though it was not explicitly stated in the analyze forwards, the European context unquestionably shaped the outlook of publishers in Krakow, a city that was internationally recognized center of culture and science. Indisputably, Nikolai Schantlerberger's greatest rival was Jan Januszowski. The term rivalry is quite adequate here, uh, as Castra Castriencia Krakowiencia contained a mention of Januszowski beating Schartenberg until he spurted blood. Januszowski, as the son of Łazarz Andrusewicz, owner of the famous printing house, and Barbara, widow of the famous publisher and printer Hieronymus Vietor, was exceptionally well prepared for the editorial profession. He had an in-depth understanding of the artistic, commercial, and intellectual aspects of the trade. His ambitions regarding illustrative materials were considerable, as was demonstrated by his intent to create icons, a series of portraits of the rulers of Poland with brief commentaries, modeled on similar volumes published abroad. Januszowski intended to create a publication in the tradition of the Renaissance cult of women illustri, which was the characteristic genre of that period. The concept of this work goes back to the 70s, but the book entitled Father Jan Guchowski's Icons of Polish Princes and Kings was not published until 1605. In this case, Januszowski was the author of the concept, the editor in charge of the whole process, and the person responsible for the final effect. Consequently, his forward includes a very personal backstory behind the creation of the book. The publisher devoted much attention to the role of depiction, showing himself knowledgeable of various theories of pictorial resemblance. As a result, he created a text of crucial importance for understanding all Polish views on the purpose of images. He stressed the commemorative, evocative, and cognitive functions of portraits. Quote, for when we look at some painted image, we swiftly impress it on our minds, and we at once assume some acquaintance with that unfamiliar person. At the same time, the, uh, he emphasized his disappointment with the illustration in his long pen book. In an attempt to justify this failure, Januszowski disclosed criminal circumstances that ruined his plan, and he wrote that he had brought over, quote, an accomplished craftsman from Germany who was most unfortunately shot dead without any fault or cause, end of quote. This referred to the incident in June 1594 in which Jörg Bruckner, the woodcutter invited from Breslau, present-day Wrocław, 
was shot dead by students living in the Jerusalem students' house in Prague, of course. Lamentations over the loss of an expert woodcutter, for whom Januszowski did not manage to find a substitute, are reminiscent of the grievances expressed in the foreword to Sienik Herbal, and again prove that skill from Schneider enjoyed a high position on the publishing market at the time. It was in the 16th century that the art of woodcut reached the apex of its artistic potential, and those who mastered it, independent printmakers and talented form schneiders alike, pursued careers that stretched beyond the borders of their home regions. A good point in case are the careers of Jost Necker or Hieronymus uh, André. The woodcutter's death prevented Januszowski from uh, completing the icons with depiction of the last two kings of Poland. He was also forced to print several images from woodblocks that had been used to illustrate a few earlier publications. Such heterogeneous origins of the illustrations partly explain the compulsion of the publisher to express his dissatisfaction with uh, the outcome. For instance, he called his icons tolerable. Januszowski's aesthetic approach comes as no surprise. In his earlier publication, he had already shown himself as a person of discerning taste sensitive to the layout and ready to apply various techniques to achieve the desired effect. Later in the foreword, Januszowski revealed which templates he had used and for what purpose. Quote, a major part of the icons were taken from royal seals to achieve greater resemblance. Using historical iconography sources was a typical feature of Renaissance culture and its predilection to archaeology. Januszowski may have come across this approach during his studies in Padua, but he may just as well have been inspired by the local Krakow tradition of the book illustration, of which the most famous example was uh, Kronika Polonorum by Maciej um, of Niechów, published in Krakow. Krakow in uh, 1521. Achieving resemblance and veracity of representation must have been of tremendous importance to Januszowski because he raised this issue once again, apologizing to his reader for the quality of illustration. Quote, be mindful that none of us is like Xerxes Heracleotes, so that he could render a person, not having ever learned to do this, or not having ever seen that person in his life, like did he, who painted a child holding grapes so painstakingly that birds came to them as if they had been real and pecked at the painting. He, who as Pliny attested, peniculam ad magnam gloriam perduxi. In these here images, you will not see such mastery. End of quote. By citing Pliny's tale about the painted grapes that appeared so real that birds came to peck at them, Januszowski used one of the most popular anecdotes on art at the time. This long reference to one of the most frequently read authors is not surprising considering the publisher's excellent education. His own texts reveal numerous allusions to ancient writers. Januszowski often availed himself to literally to Paul to express praise, therefore it should not have come as a surprise that he made use of the same rhetorical device to express disapproval. References to the theme of Xerxes' grapes were popular in, uh, in artistic laudations, but above all, which is important in this case, they meant that mimetic quality of the art was highly valued. 
Januszowski's comments also revealed a growing awareness of the achievement of leading foreign printing centers and the value, both artistic and commercial, of the appropriate layer of a book. As has already been mentioned, the publisher had a strong aesthetic sensitivity and he understood the importance of illustration and typography. For this reason, Januszowski aspired to create a new Polish national typeface. This was one of the purposes of his new Polish character from 1594. In this publication, he made an attempt to create a dedicated typeface motivated by the sense of rivalry with other nations. In the foreword to this book, Januszowski stressed that, quote, Publishing new and unusual things is risky, end of quote, and he also boasted his knowledge of the achievements of the leading publishers of the day, emphasizing at the same time that they benefited from the founding of generous patrons. It is certain that Januszowski believed that they had, sorry, that they had been able to develop their art thanks to the financial support. Quote, we heard of the Roberts, Henri's and Stephens from Paris, who received major sums from the private treasure of King Henry II, if I remember correctly, to save the publication of Greek typefaces. We also heard of the commendable Aldus Manutius of Venice, who grew so large in this profession because of a dignified Pope Pius VI. Also, within our living memory, we heard of planting, to whom I cannot seem an equal, nor do the centuries to come seem likely to bring an equal to him, who received 24,000 crowns as support from King Philip of Spain. Of course, uh, in this last sentence, Jan Szoski referred to famous monumental work uh, of Christoph Plantin, so-called Pidiarelia. This way, Jan Szoski displayed his ambition and willingness to compete uh, with other publishers. Praising local achievements in various forms was one of the major themes of Renaissance culture, but at the same time, Januszowski's aesthetic taste was unquestionably shaped by pan-European influences. The publisher had already made it clear in his private correspondence with Bishop Martin Cromer when he was preparing his Salivarniense for print. In his letter, dated 1585, he wrote as follows, quote, However, when choosing the ornamental typeface, I would go for one that even our adversaries would find praiseworthy. The sun has not turned away from us, and it, if we have the right tools, we can equal anyone in the term of taste. End of quote. The publisher forwards analyzed in this paper reveal the extent of the author's awareness of the professional and intellectual challenges of their trade. They also give an insight into the changing expectation regarding the form of the book and how book reflected the major artistic and cognitive challenges of the time. In their forwards, Scharfenberger and Januszowski signaled these issues to the readers and thus a growing circle of recipients was increasingly more aware of the art of the book, the complex process of editing a text, and the importance of giving it appropriate presentation. As a result, the text formulated by these Krakow-based publishers give us a rare insight into the awareness of current professional challenges and readers' expectations regarding the appearance of the book. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Joanna, for your presentation. And now I would like uh, to say sorry for our listeners from Lithuania as we 
don't have the translation into Lithuanian language. The conference is going on just in English, so sorry for this. And I would like to remind our listeners that you are able and you are very welcome to ask the questions. And uh, you can do it by writing them in the bar on the bottom of the screen. And we will, the speakers will have the possibility to answer all of them uh, after the session, after all presentations. And now it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Bartolomei Czarski, uh, an assistant professor at the University of Warsaw uh, Institute of Classical Studies, whose research focuses on the evaluation of ancient culture in the Renaissance and Baroque, as well as on the history of literature in the context of the history of the book. And he's going to present his paper, The Poetic Setic Setting on, of Title Pages in the First Crack of Prince. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to me uh, to present you my paper on a poetic setting of uh, the title pages in the first Krakow prints. However, before I will start to talk about uh, Krakow printing, I would like to start with a more general introduction about the title page itself. So let's start. At the beginning of its existence, the printed book almost completely imitated the manuscript one. Readers were simply accustomed to this solution, and the first printers didn't want to create a new text medium at all, but only to speed up and facilitate the production of books in the form in which they knew them. Bibli bibliographic information, therefore, appeared in the incipit as well in in explicit, and the title pages didn't exist at all. This part of the book slowly began to form only from the 60s of the 15th century. At first, it was characterized by considerably diversity and a lack of a clear convention. Very few and laconic information appeared on it. Sometimes the author was indicated, sometimes the title. Later, on the title page, sometimes also printer's mark was stamped. In the 80s of the 15th century, a significant proportion of books printed in Germany, France, and the Netherlands already had title pages with fairly extensive information about the works they contained. Whereas the first title page closest to the modern one was submitted in the 1500 by the Leipzig printer Wolfgang Stickel, and here, is, here it is. Interestingly, in the context of the further content of my speech, this print was strongly associated with Krakow. The book in question is Exercitium Super Omnes Tractatus Parvorum Logicalium Petri Hispani, by Jan from Głogów, professor at the Krakow Academy. It was ordered by Jan Halle, Krakow merchant and entrepreneur, owner of a bookstore, who later also developed a thriving publishing company in the capital of the Kingdom of Poland. The development of the title page has already been fairly well presented by book historians. The works to date have focused primarily on its overall evolution, especially on the gradual emergence of new elements. Especially noteworthy here is the book by Margaret M. Smith, the title page, its every development from 1460 to 1510. However, these studies are still worth supplementing. It may be particularly interesting to note how into the title page, at first probably a blank protective card, was introduced that what was the most important for the book, the text. Quite quickly, apart from the title itself, First, only in the abbreviated form, additional content was, pl was placed there. There were various poems recommending reading the work contained in the volume, mottos taken from the Holy Scriptures or classical literature, and other works of paraliterary character. Epigrams printed directly on the title page already occur in the 70s of the 15th century. It even happens that they are the only text printed on it. In such a situation, they usually perform a function of a dedication, as in the case of Confessionale by Sant Antoni, printed in Venice in 1474, and here it is. These poems and excerpts from other texts were usually of great importance as paratext 
to influence the reception of the work contained in the book or to build an image of the publishing house. The title page has become a special part of the printed book, being its most prominent element. Visible at first glance, it has gained great importance as a carrier of various advertising, propaganda, moralizing or devotional content. As the title page structure matured, early publishers learned to better use the opportunities it provided. Among others, skillfully combining textual and graphic material together, thus creating coherent, expressive messages. Poems appealing to the reader from the title page made it visually attractive, announced the content of the book, indicated the direction of the further reading, were a form of publishing advertising, tried to create a positive image of the publishing house, the printer, or the author himself. In addition to the advertising function, poems from the title pages sometimes also fully fight characteristic tasks of critical literary texts. They argued with possible critics or exaggerated the author's goals. This practice is already visible in the 15th century. It is worth looking at the first card of collected poetry by Domenico Palladio Soriano, and here it is. Any critic, before he even opens this volume, receives a laconic response to the unfav unfavorable judgment. And like a, let's have a closer look at this epigram. Concise mottos or quotes from classical literature could also perform similar functions. It happened that they were to describe the main content of the book through an accurate point. Other cases, in turn, were characterized by a predominance of panegyric content. In this situation, we usually deal with epigrams praising the author, focusing on his moral and intellectual qualities. Choosing appropriate extracts from ancient world, works of the Holy Bible, which will fit perfectly into the message on the title page, can be considered an elaborate procedure. The authority of their source further enhances the persuasive potential of the message. Interesting from the formal point of view are in turn cases of combining the word and image, much ahead of the publication of the first emblem book, which is Emblematum Liber by Andrea Alciato, published in 1531. It was no different in the capital city of Kingdom of Poland. Because Polish printing customs were basically fully modeled on German conventions. This is not surprising. All the first printers active in Poland were ethnically German. This applies to both the 15th century, when the first migratory printers appeared at Vistula, such as Kaspar Straube, and the beginning of the 16th century, when the first more stable printing houses were created. At the time, the first verse forms appeared on the title pages of books printed in Poland. It is believed that the first permanent Polish printing house was opened by Kaspar Hochfeder in 1503. Hochfeder is also the first Polish printer to put a poem on the title page. He did so as soon as the new workshop was launched. It, it is worth noting that Hochfeder didn't always reach for, a new, epi for new epigrams. Sometimes, it was more convenient to use the text that had already accompanied the same title before. There are epigrams, often anonymous, which are repeated by different printers when republishing the same text. Such a poem is found on the title page of Aristotle's Libri Octo de Physica Auditu. And here we have this, uh, here we have this title page. Under the expanded title and above the publishing address, as impressed from Krakowie, which means printed in Krakow, is the epigram entitled Ad Lectorem, to the reader. And once more, have a closer look to this poem. This poem is a form of encouragement to read. It also tells us a, a lot about the people for whom this publication is intended. The wording Studiosa Juventus, learned youth, certainly refers to the students of the Krakow University. First of all, they will be interested in this publication. Therefore, the book should be useful during studies. The well-read students who reached for it certainly noticed that the poem that encourages them to delve into the writings of Aristotle 
contains a learned allusion to Virgil's poetry. Its first verse resembles a fragment of Georgics, Felix qui potuit rerum cognostere causas. This graceful epigram, as I have already mentioned, has a longer history. In the same year, for example, Martin Landsberg, who was active in Leipzig, joined it in his edition of Aristotle's writings. And here it is, the Landsberg title page. Subsequent Krakow printers were more and more eager to reach for this form of diversifying title cards. Often, they were not satisfied just with using the text only, and they tried to skillfully combine it with graphic elements. In this context, it is worth looking at the books that came out of the printing house of Florian Ungler, sometimes considered the first Renaissance Polish printer. In the years from 1510 to 1516, this typographer placed various poems on 32 title pages, while at the time he published a total of 80 works. Almost half of them were therefore given some verse-like literary form. Ungler introduced poems to his title pages in various ways. The first of them seems to be the simplest. Directly under the title of the work, an epigram was printed, which sometimes occupied almost all the remaining space. This is the case with Introductorium Compediosum in Tractatum Sphere Materialis by, by Jan from Głogów, printed in 1513, and here we have this title page. There is nothing else on the title page by, but the full title and poem directed to the reader, Epigramma ad lectorem. This solution particularly exposes the text of a poetic work. The reader or the person intended in buying the work are not distracted by other elements in their, and their attention can only focus on the message of the epigram. A slightly, a slightly different situation occurs when the content of the title page is placed in a woodcut frame. This is the case which we've printed in 1513, Linealis Calculatio by Sebastian Pauschner, which is visible right now. Most of the title pages is filled with an impressive frame, in the center of which there is a space for inserting the title and additional content. The reader's eyes first notice the impressive graphic decoration, only then draws attention to the title of the work and the poem placed below it, this time entitled Octos Tichonad Lectorem, which means eight verses directed to the reader. It is worth noting that in both cited cases, the authors of the epigrams added to the titles were not indicated. This is not a rare situation at all. These texts often appeared anonymously or were reprinted in the same form as in the earlier edition of the work with which they, with, with which they were associated. In the case of Ungler's workshop, it is interesting that he rarely repeated the previously created verses. In general, completely new poems were written for the needs of his publishing house. Mostly this task belonged to editors who dealt with the preparation of specific text for printing. In this regard, Ungler collaborated with an interesting group of people, mostly associated with the Krakow Academy. They were professors of the university or traveling humanists who stayed in Krakow for some time and for profit probably established co cooperation with the local printer. Leading Polish humanists also belong to this group, including well-known poets such as Johannes Dantiscus, Paulus Krosnensis and Laurentius Corvinus. And here is the full list of these cooperators. Most often, however, poems from the title pages of Ungler's prints were written by Rudolf Agricola. He, he composed eight of them. One of them is the epigram from Processus Judicarius by Johann Auerbach, published between 1512 and 1514. And here we have this title page. Also here, the epigram was embedded in a magnificent woodcut frame which in addition to ornamental functions, also indicates the place of printing. Two coats of arms testify about it. The eagle of the Polish kingdom placed above and the emblem of Krakow visible below. The title was given at the top above the frame containing the poem. 
Particularly interesting from the point of view of book construction are situations in which poems form a coherent construction with visual material. As a result, created are compositions that can be called proto-emblems because they were ma made much before the release of Emblematum Liber by Andrea Ciato. We find several such cases in Ungler's early publications. First, let's look at the title page of Somnia Danielis, Daniel's Dreams from 1520, uh, 1512, sorry. And here we have the title page of this print. In its center, there is a fairly long epigram and below it, a woodcut illustration. It depicts the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, also known as Nabuchodonosor, worshipping the prophet Daniel, who thoroughly explained the mysterious dreams of the ruler. The epigram above is entitled Ad Lectorem, once more to the reader. And first of all, it's to encourage the reader to look through the entire texts. The presented composition resembles an emblem, but its arrangement is reversed. First, a poem was placed, followed by the woodcut illustration. The composition from the title page of Passio Jesu Christi Salvatoris Mundi by Benedictus Halidonius is more classic from the formal point of view. Ungler published this text in 1514, and here, we, here it is. The reader's attention is at first caught by a scene of, scene, sorry, of the crucified Christ. Below it is a tetrastic bearing at the title Christus at peccatorem, Christ to the sinner. The relationship between the visual and textual element is very strong here. However, this whole composition was repeated after other earlier editions. It is particularly worth recalling here the Nurnberg edition of 1511, which contains woodcuts made by Albrecht Dürer. It is also the source of the epigram in Ungler's issue. Into the category of emblems, also stem stemmata can be included. These terms mean poems written on coat of arms, which were very popular in Kingdom of Poland from the very beginning of the 16th century and then in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The oldest Polish stemma was published in 1512. From all from, from Florian Ungler also used these compositions willingly. The earliest example of this can be found on the title page of the panegyric created by Jan Dantiscus on the occasion of the victory at Orsha in 1514. And here we have this title page. The illustration that creates it presents various emblems related to Jagiellonian dynasty and the capital city of Krakow. Here we can see Pogon, Vitis, Polish Eagle, columns of Gediminas, scepters of the Krakow Academy, as well as the coat of arms of the city itself. Under the woodcut, there is an epigram of Valente Eck, a wandering humanist cooperating with Ungler on various levels. The poem is dedicated to the reader and encourages both to look at the codes of arms visible above and to read the words of Dantiscus. And let's have a closer look at the poem itself. In this work, the double meaning of the word arma was used, which primarily means weapons, here sung by Dantiscus, just as Virgil celebrated the weapons of Aeneas and his companions in Enaid. The first verse of the ex epigram is, an, is a reminiscent of the proemium of that great ancient poem. Latin term arma is also commonly used to mean coat of arms. The reader is therefore encouraged to read the song of Victoria Orsha as well as to carefully watch the Jagiellonian emblems. Probably at the end of 1515, in Ungler's workshop, appeared Prognostikon Vratislaviensis for the year 1516 by Gandolfus Grusenius, and you may see the title page here. This author was a humanist associated with Vienna, doctor of arts and medicine, most likely connected by personal relations with Laurentius Corvinus, Silesian scholar and poet settled at the Vistula. The publication of this print in Krakow indicates strong links between uh, strong links connecting the Polish capital with Silesia. Usually, this type of astrological and calendar publications 
was published at the, at the end of the year preceding the one to which it concerned. Therefore, it should, it should be supposed that the print appeared just around December or possibly November of the year 1515. On the title page, Wingler placed a woodcut depicting an angel holding two shields. On one, we can see the head of St. John, and on the other, the letter W. So these figures are known from the emblem of Wrocław, a city where most of exemplars of this publication would probably hit. Under the woodcut was added an epigram of the already mentioned Corvinus, and here we have this text. The concept used in the epigram is to associate the head of St. John with an intellect, and the letter W, formed by two letters V, with virtue in Latin virtus, and strength in Latin vis. As we can see, the lines from the title cards could be very sophisticated. The presented examples well show that adding various literary forms to the title page content was a popular solution at the beginning of the 16th century. In this respect, Krakow printers imitated many German typographers, although it happened that some poems were used many times. Above all, the, all the efforts were to create new verses. Over time, however, literary additions begin to disappear from the title pages. Most often they were transferred to the inside of the book. Poems to the reader, to Zoil, small panegyrics, advertising works, and stemmata, starting about the mid 16th century, more and more often were pressed on the back of the title page or before the dedication. They were also often placed at the end of the book. This doesn't mean that this form has completely left the title page. Small epigrams in this part of the book occur even in the 18th century but it happens with a much lower frequency than it was at the end of the 15th century at, at the beginning of the 16th. And that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Once more, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bartolomeo. And now I'm glad to introduce our next speaker, Gabriele Vix from the University of Bonn. Department of German Comparative and Cultural Studies with an international focus on the in interface between art and literature of the 20th and the 21st centuries. And Gabriele Vick's presentation is called Dip Your Finger in a Sea of Inks, Ink, Marx Ernst and the Book. The floor is yours, Gabriele. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. The paper is based on two exhibitions about Max Ernst's literary book work that I had the pleasure to curate and a publication on the topic that I had the pleasure to edit. Its title reads in German, Tunke, den Finger ins Tintenmeer, Max Ernst und das Buch. I'm going to explore two issues. First, the still unknown experimental intermediate literary bookwork of the visual artist Max Ernst. Second, the question of how to present his books adequately in a book about these books. But first of all, greetings from the Rhineland. This is the Max Ernst Museum in Max Ernst hometown Rühl near Cologne, opened in 2005. A U-shaped Wilhelminian style complex has been joined by a new block with a foyer, temporary exhibition areas and a lecture hall. The permanent collection, however, is housed in the old building and the main exhibition space is the former dance hall where Max Ernst used to have fun as a student. Max Ernst was born in 1891 in the Rhineland and died 1976 in Paris. As a visual artist, he receives the highest recognition worldwide. As a poet, he is largely unknown. What makes his literary work so important are two aspects in particular. 
It is a literary work beyond literature and it pays a great deal of attention to the body of the book. Other key features of Max Ernst's writings are multilingualism. He wrote in three languages, French, German and English, and the author's fundamental will to reinvent himself time and again, according to his famous dictum, an artist who has found himself is lost. He used to translate his texts himself, and then he took the chance to rewrite them. This is why his printed texts show an intriguing variance, which also applies to the different editions of his books. In constant change, experimenting with image and text, language and printing, his books make a significant contribution to the artist's book in the 20th century. In keeping with this particular character of Max Ernst's writings, the approach to his literary work is taken from a perspective that looks at the book in its materiality. Today, digital transformation processes in which leafing through the book shifts to navigating across surfaces have sharpened the view of the, quote, sophisticated spatial arrangement of book-shaped textuality. As Carlos Spörhase puts it, one of the protagonists in the discourse around the book and its material body. While the subtitle Max Ernst in the book indicates the main focus of the study, the title Tunke den Finger ins Tintenmeer puts the emphasis on the poet Max Ernst. It quotes the beginning of a poem from the cycle Paramythen, Paramus, here it is. A side note at this point. As for the photos, we were looking for a way to show the book in its material body without fetishizing it. That is why the photographer did not shoot the books vertically, but at an angle. We also used a neutral gray background and tried to avoid an overly intense shadowing. Back to the quote of Max Ernst's poem. Referring to ink, a material serving for writing as well as drawing, the invitation forms the leitmotif in the approach to the artist Max Ernst as a writer. Opposite the poem, you see an illustration no text without picture, that is almost the rule with Max Ernst. The assumption is that it is a pen and ink drawing. In fact, Max Ernst used the collage technique based on old-fashioned wood engravings, scissors and glue. Like a writer prints his manuscripts, he printed his collages, carefully making sure that the seams were not visible. In this picture, you see a young girl on the ladder leaning against a street lamp. Apparently, she is fascinated by a large butterfly and strange enough, she does not feel threatened either by the serpent or by the skeleton. Some men in the background are watching the scene. Every detail contains cross-references through Max Ernst's work, which cannot be followed up here. I would rather like to pursue the question of the relationship between image and text. Here we encounter a phenomenon characteristic of Max Ernst's writings. Parambis was published first in the US in an exhibition catalogue of the gallery of the painter William Copley. The words made their way from English into German and from there into different versions in French. While the texts vary from language to language and from publication to publication, the images remain stable. The relationship between image and text is nevertheless loose. In the first English version from 1949, 
The only textual reference to the image is lamp and the possessive pronoun her. Only in the subsequent German and French versions, there are more references to the picture. From this, we learn that the image does not just illustrate the text, but conversely, the image does have an influence on the text. At the same time, there is an astonishing independence of image and text when it comes to publishing. Pictures are often shown alone in exhibitions. Texts are sometimes printed without illustrations. To move on to the second part of my paper, how to make a book on books. The publication accompanying the exhibition about Max Ernst's literary book work was not intended to be an exhibition catalogue, but an independent, comprehensive reference book. There are essays on all the poet's creative phases, including an essay from one of the most important, important German contemporary authors, the Büchner Prize winner Marcel Bayer. Moreover, it contains facsimiles of archival material and a commented bibliography listing all the different versions of the book which Ernst published as a writer. Each version is illustrated on half pages. Before I show you the overall graphic concept of the publication, I would like to start leafing through a few pages of the bibliography to give a deeper insight into the diversity of Max Ernst's literary work and how we represented it. The first example is a collage novel. From 1929 to 1934, Max Ernst published a total of three collage novels. The last one, Une semaine de bonté, ou les sept et les mots capitaux, A Week of Kindness, or The Seven Deadly Elements, was to be published in seven continuation issues corresponding to the seven days of the week. For financial reasons, the last three issues were combined into one. The five issues are collected in a slipcase. Each booklet has a different color. The second French edition and the first German edition in the identical layout, however, combine the five issues in one book. The colors have given way to a white cover, the expressive horror typography to a calligraphy and a well-behaved vignette. The OESH version, this is number 24, returns to the horror scenario by showing the enlargement of a detail from Max Ernst collage on the cover. The second example shows the different editions of the cycle Paramus. I flip through the pages and I will come back to number 32. All the different publications of Paramus the American edition that you see here, the first German edition, that's the blue book. Here a page with explanations, then the red book, a reprint in German, the blue book, the French edition, and on the right side, the trilingual edition, where And all these um, publications were known in research except one. In 1954, a newsletter of the Fragmente Verlag, which operated the then 27-year-old publisher Rainer Maria Gerhardt, announced that the book Paramythen by Max Ernst would be completed in the next few days. And the reader was informed in detail about the format the different editions, the binding, the paper, the price, and so on. This young publisher was mainly interested in contemporary American literature, and he possibly got to know the American edition of Paramyths in 1949, 
and asked Max Ernst for a German edition in his publishing house. It is interesting enough that Max Ernst agreed to work together with such a young publisher. Shortly thereafter, in July 1954, the publisher committed suicide, which was also the end of his publishing house. There was no trace of the planned book. Surprisingly, in January 2019, just in time for the exhibition and the publication on the Max Ernst project, an antiquarian bookseller offered a contact pressure of this very edition. Twelve leaves, light brown and water stained, the edges torn. The sheets are stapled and double folded, folded in Japanese binding style. The headlines are right justified, the verses are loosely set. Rainer Maria Gerhardt's typographical signature. This find proves now, after 65 years, that Gerhardt's concept and typography had been taken over in the edition of the Gallery der Spiegel from 1955, without making this transparent, and that his edition of the Paramyths announced in the newsletter was not lost after all. The last example shows the anthology of Max Ernst's writing, which was published in Paris in 1970. There is a regular and a special edition. The dust jacket is an original lithography by Max Ernst. Écriture, writings, has never been reprinted. But in 2021, the German language edition of Max Ernst's writings will finally be published. It will not be identical with Écriture. Now we look at the overall graphic concept of the book, which tried to reveal the connection between Max Ernst as an artist, poet, and book designer. There were only three agreements with the graphic designers Silke Farnert and Uwe Koch Cologne. The wording of the title, the manner in which Max Ernst's books were photographed and the requirement to reproduce previously unprinted drawings by Max Ernst on the cover. Imagine the excitement when the graphic designer presented their design on the screen in their studio. To anticipate it right away, there was nothing but details to change. On the cover, the quotation is highlighted in italics. The two little figures who seem to greet the reader, there are another two who toddle off on the back cover, are part of a series of ink drawings which were created by Max Ernst while writing a stage play for the book Histoire Naturelle 2, Natural Histories No. 2, published by the Galerie der Spiegel in 1965. The manuscripts we publish in the book show that writing and drawing go hand in hand, hand, in hand in his work. The sketches were not used at that time, but they were included in the catalogue raisonné. Yet they remained unnoticed for over 50 years in the archive of the gallery. In fact, I'm very proud to have obtained the printing rights for the first copy of these sketches because they testify to the intermediality of Ernst's writing. Likewise, the background of the cover also refers to the visual artist. It was an invitation card from the 1950s from which the designers took over the motive. It shows the technique of rubbing or frottage, which Max Ernst discovered in 1925 in an inn on the French Atlantic coast when rubbing the wooden structure of the washed out plank floor on a piece of paper. Histoire naturelle 
Natural History was the title of the portfolio, which he published in 1925 and returned to 40 years later. Here the best title, the main title and the table of contents. The somehow weird illustrations, what is a whale doing on a title page, are taken from this template. At the dotted line, Ernst cut the pattern and used it for two small works in 1920. Keep in mind the whale, the bear and the late table. Max Ernst overpainted many figures and made a surreal room. The master's sleeping room. It's worth spending a night here, the title reads. The adoption of a motif from Max Ernst in the book design ironically mixes the layers. The object of the design becomes part of the design itself. This ironic game is also applied to the overall design of the publication in the graphical highlighting of the chapter structure. Actually, it takes up the design of Max Ernst's last collage novel. Let me flip through the book. Each new chapter is marked with a new color. Each new article starts on the following page which carries the author's name and the full title on a strip that reminds of a flap cover, so that different books seem to be gathered together in the book. The colors and layout are adapted from the five issues of the Semaine de Bonté, even the typeface in horror style, but in a more stylized or abstract way. On the last page, there is another illustration taken from the template that Max Ernst used for his overpaintings. You might remember the motif. On the thank you page, the fat brown bear looks at the reader with a grin. To conclude with a look at the back cover. Two little figures are trolling off and a quotation of Alain Bosquet summarizes the study of Max Ernst's books. Anyone who wants to understand Max Ernst must seriously learn to be unreasonable. For this he wrote, cut and pasted his books. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabriele, for presenting us a little known work by Max Ernst and his input to the 20th century artist book. And now it's time to listen to the last presentation of this session prepared by Dr. Christiana Abele. Uh, an art historian and editor, editor, a senior researcher at the Institute of Art History of the Art Academy in Latvia, in Riga. And her topic today is joining forces for the art of the homeland. Sorry, I will say it in English as I don't know how to pronounce in German. Uh, yearbook for fine art in the Baltic provinces from the perspectives of artistic collaboration, visual documentation, design, and typography. You are welcome, Christiana. Dear colleagues, my name is Christiana Abele. I'm working at the Institute of Art History at the Art Academy of Latvia. And at the moment, I'm greeting you from Riga, wishing to be in Vilnius instead. Looking at the first slide of my presentation, after reading the title, you may not notice a small unobtrusive seal-like emblem, a logotype, in the lower left corner containing three capital letters, 
JPK continued in a linear enclosure. These letters pronounced not in an English manner as GBK but as JBK according to their original German pronunciation and also Latvian pronunciation will reappear during my talk in various visual settings standing for the Jahrbuch für Bildende Kunst in den Ostseeprovinzen, the Yearbook for Fine Art in the Baltic Provinces or simply and most usually Baltic Art Yearbook. It would be possible and adequate to abbreviate the title of this publication in another way too, but its creators selected JBK for their logotype and signature, where B may uh, mean both Baltic, Baltisch and Bildende, Baltic and fine in terms of fine arts. Therefore, I will use it consistently uh, in the slide captions and comments to describe a series of annual publications representing the most important achievements in the locally new field of Riga art book industry in the beginning of the 20th century before the First World War. On the next slide, you can see a title page and six different covers for the Baltic Art Yearbooks Volumes 1 to 7, published between 1907 and 1913, when immediate continuation was made impossible by the war soon afterwards. All the copies of the pilot volume 1 I have encountered so far had lost their original cover, whereas the more successful sequels too have an often traumatic biography written on their faces. Thus, uh, try to imagine these designs without the blue framing that belongs to repainting upon which the old cover has been pasted with margins reduced from all sides in the Art Academy of Latvia library. These yearbooks have been widely used as containers of unique visual information about all branches of early 20th century art, from painting and architecture to artistic crafts. In the volume 4 of the Art History of Latvia, published by our institute in uh, 2014, images from Jebeka illustrate all chapters showing numerous lost artworks, especially by Baltic German artists, vanished interiors and buildings which do not exist anymore or have been completely changed. A more recent research publication of prominence where JPK has played a principal role as a visual source is Professor Sylvia Gross's voluminous monograph about the architect architectural decor of the Arnovo period in Riga. Writing about the turn of the 20th century artistic life for the above mentioned art history of Latvia, I summarized the importance of JBK in terms of organization, artistic collaboration, and information exchange about art. The call for papers of this conference with its focus on uh, the material nature of the book made me realize uh, that this container of treasures, the JBK, has not yet uh, received uh, adequately versatile analysis of its own right and in its entirety, considering the interaction of various aspects, aesthetic program of artistic collaboration, visual documentation of art, effects of design and topography, reception in the society, immediate impact, and others. 
Furthermore, my application was associated with an intention to undertake uh, additional archival research in order to check whether the documentary legacy of the Yebek Yebekas publisher, Riga Society of Architects, in the Latvian State History Archive, still hides unexplored sources with respect to the publication project. In this spring, any new archival investigation certainly had to be postponed for better times. After the end of the lockdown, the public art yearbook itself is digitalized and available online in the National Library uh, of Latvia digital collection of books. It is the first place where to look for it if any of you feel interested in uh, to study this publication in greater detail. In respect to aesthetic and emotional qualities, this source, however, can give us somewhat distorted or rather flattened impression. For instance, because the scanned copies often lack such elements as covers and end papers, most likely lost during repeated rebindings of library copies. It would be very difficult and misleading to speak about the fascination of YBK just on the basis of the digital sources. Therefore, my main objects of presentation will be the volumes 1908 and 1911 that I have the pleasure to have at home. Uh, and in some slides, I will prefer somewhat blurred photos uh, to a flattening scan in order to share the feel these old bodies evoke with their palpable three-dimensional presence. Here, some historical facts seem to be necessary. Hibeka was founded in 1907, uh, not by the Riga Art Society, Riga Schakunstverein, from which we could expect, expect something of the sorts, but by the Riga Architect Society, that set the task of reflecting not just remarkable finished buildings, sketches and models, competition projects, etc., but also works by local painters, sculptors and artistic craftsmen to give a unified scene of the development of art in the Baltics as far as possible. The society was convinced that the yearbook uh, should become the organ of the local art world, creating a closer link between the artist and the public. The editorial committee included architects Edgar Hartmann, Her Hermann Hartmann, Eduard Kupfer, Asian Slaube, Wilhelm Rissler, Alexander Schmeling and Hermann Säuberlich, together with artists Erich von Kampenhausen and Gerhard von Rosen. As you see from the live dates, uh, almost all of them uh, back then were young uh, or even very young people. Most of them were close colleagues and fellow students at the Riga Polytechnic Institute. The Riga Society of Architects together with the Riga Technical Society, had already managed to publish the important volume Giga and its buildings in 1902. Sorry, in 1903, but in 1902, Riga typographer Alexander Grosset painted uh, printed art historian and architect Wilhelm Neumann's book Baltische Maler and uh, Bildhauer des 19. Jahrhunderts, Baltic uh, painters and sculptors of the 19th century, biographical essays with portraits of artists and reproductions of their works. 
proving that local masters are able to produce high quality art prints according to the standards of the age. Hibeka, coming from the typography of the newspaper Riga Tageblatt, was the most continuous and successful follower of the strength setting present of the homeland to itself, as uh, Neumann's book uh, was uh, described uh, in the foreword uh, by its typographer. Until then, all art-related books by local authors and publishers were printed abroad, predominantly in Berlin and Leipzig. The Baltic Jebeka obviously had an important foreign prototype, the Jahrbuch der Bildenden Kunst, uh, the previous Almanac für Bildende Kunst und Kunstgewerbe, published with a similar title and identical abbreviation since 1902 in Berlin. You can recognize uh, the many times repeated combination of YBK also in uh, the design of its pilot cover. When the first volume of Rikaport Jebeka had been quickly distributed, the Society of Architects took the risk of doubling the print run, increasing the number of color supplements and employing more expensive printing techniques. Subscriptions were accepted in all the largest Baltic cities it means in the now Latvia and Estonia, as well as in certain bookshops in St. Petersburg and Moscow. The volume two of 1908 was noticed by a respectable professional journal and of book industry, the Archiv für Buchgewerbe the Leipzig-based periodical of the German Book Trade Society, giving a brief but highly positive, entirely positive review of Jebeka's qualities in terms of design, layout, typography and artistic content. I quote, Besides the rich contents of this interesting publication, a special interest should be paid to its excellent typographic execution. Enriched with many good illustrations, this book is designed and printed in the best way in the book and art printing house of the Riga Tageblatt, Paul Kirkovius. Furthermore, the contents and visual decoration give a very decent picture of the modern art development in Baltic provinces, and it is a great pleasure to see that many artists of high reputation in Germany come from Baltic counties. End of quotation. Let us take a closer look at the object of this praise. The cover was lithographed by the Reisberg print shop in Riga after a drawing by Alfred Puritz, a Latvian artist from St. Petersburg. On one of the pages, we can see a set of other design proposals for this volume. According to the practice of the editorial committee to organize a competition with uh, selected sketches being exhibited and published in the new volume. Like in his other graphic designs in that time, Puritz referred to German Renaissance for inspiration. Notably, the covers of Jebeka were designed uh, by young Baltic artists and architects, all young people of German, Russian and Latvian origin. Architecture student uh, Alexander Krasnoselsky uh, designed the cover of the first volume, uh, Puritz the second one, and book printer Alexander Grosset's daughter Margot Grosset, uh, then a student at the Tugesen Academy of Art, the covers for the third and fourth volumes. Graphic designer Alexander Baranowski uh, was responsible for the fifth. Latvian architecture student Paul Skunzinsch for the sixth. 
and painter Otto von Kursel for the seventh volume cover. Eight papers of the volume in discussion were designed by a young woman artist, Ellen Seraphim, who was 20 years old at that time. Linear lettering and vignettes in the first volumes uh, were made by Jules Petersen, an artist whose life dates still remain unknown, although he was employed at the Riga City Art Museum and was the archivist of the Artists Club Kunstecke. It is Petersen whom we owe the Jebeka's monogramic logotype and according uh, to some references the general decorative concept of the pilot volumes. Farther on, the initial vignette of the first article in Jebeka 1908 was designed by Ellen Seraphim's immediate age mate, the 20-year Gertrude Kranhaus, to initiate an essay about the functions of art criticism by journalist Paul Schiemann, later a persistent promoter of Latvian independence and democratic values. Looking for the logotype placed sometimes somewhat irregularly on various backgrounds, let us look how YBK presented its fall color supplements, some four uh, to five in every issue, changing the background in order to match the color scheme or atmosphere of the artwork. This practice was continued during the whole publication period of Yebeka, while some other minor features were given up or changed. In the volume 1911, with Alexander Baranowski's cover, Zuza Walter's Griech seashore landscape is harmonized with a background from a similar tonal range, whereas the brown background from a similar uh, breakdown paper joins the interplay of contrasting color areas in Alyssa Dmitriev's woodcut for the schoolgirl reading. This spread uh, actually is one of my favorites in its uh, juxtaposition of two artworks the sculptural portrait of the late Latvian writer Rudolf Blaumanis by Theodor Selkans, and the little livery reader, also the editors of the yearbook, hardly knew Blaumanis' joyful, humorous tale, Velnini, Little Devils, uh, that has been read with pleasure by children and two children of all the following generations since then. Perhaps on purpose, this spread is followed by a glimpse into the results of municipal school building program to the designs by the city architect Reinhold Schmeling. Thus, the insert of Alisa Dmitriev's print with a schoolgirl reading could establish a new link in the functional underlying structure of sections illustrating particular branches of art, architecture, painting, sculpture, graphic arts, and artistic crafts. We have a serious work in front of us, which we can only regard with respect. Artist and art critic Yulis Moderniks, a Latvian, stated, uh, concluding an already retrospective analysis of the first volume, and in his opinion, the yearbook certainly deserves recognition from the Latvian side too. Discussing the last volume, 
is fellow student at the Stiglitz School in St. Petersburg and opponent on many issues, Gustav Stilters mentioned that from the aspect of content, this publication would perhaps be more correctly titled if it was renamed uh, the Yearbook of Baltic German Art. Nevertheless, he did admit that the Latvian press also has paid much attention to it every year, as this is the only art periodical in our homeland. In all, the yearbook managed to realize the principle of national cooperation to a greater extent than did uh, the Baltic Artists Association and other uh, multicultural initiatives at that time. Inspired by the example of the Architect Society, the Industrios photographer and art salon owner Janis Riekts developed the idea uh, that Latvians could have their own similar almanac. A reproduction from the 1920s shows a lost cover drawing by Richard's by Richard Sorinch with the text Latvian Art Volume 1 Publisher Riekts in Riga. Artist Janis Rosenthal's, however, voiced his doubts in the review of the third yearbook of Baltic art in spring 1910, saying that such a Latvian edition, as intended by Mr. Riekts, seems to be more of a one-time venture. Even this cautious prognosis turned out to be too optimistic, because uh, Latvian art as a yearbook did not appear even once. The plans of the Latvian Art Promotion Society, established in 1911, to publish a journal or almanac, were also left unfulfilled in the following years. When the large Latvian art exhibition was held in Riga in 1910, to start a series of regular events, the YBK of that year represented a selection of exhibits, including a portrait of an old Lithuanian woman, an early lost masterpiece by the young academic artist Janis Robert Stilbergs, and it may well be uh, that uh, uh, these uh, images were planned to be included and reproductions already made by Riekts uh, for his uh, failed Latvian almanac. Although the local area, uh, the focal area of YBK's coverage included three Baltic provinces, Estonia, Lithuania, and Kurland, uh, Lithuanian art was represented by Petrus Kalpokas when he lived in Jelgova and was an active participant of Baltic art exhibitions. A color plate in the final paper issue of YBK shows his sunset scene of 1912 that was obtained by the Riga uh, City Art Museum and now belongs to the Latvian National Museum of Art. The volume 7 in 1913 closed the paper history of YBK. Thirteen years later, in 1926, the renewed Riga Society of Architects made an effort to restart the yearbook publishing the volume 8. The Baltic provinces already was a retrospective concept associated with the Russian imperial past, and the new intention of editors was to embrace the historical and contemporary achievements in the all three new Baltic states as seen from the subjects in the main textual contributions uh, of this publication. Unfortunately, it was the final chapter in the history of YBK. If we look at the cover of the last volume, 
designed by architect Kurt Bedke, and its title page, they seem to belong to entirely different worlds that cannot meet, and also this contrast implies a gap that could not be bridged for the sake of a new life. A century afterwards, the volumes of Yebeka want to be turned back again and again, still promising to answer many questions, reveal many connections, and conjure up the visual culture of the early 20th century Latvia, belonging itself to the artistically designed environment that was represented on its pages, ranging from architectural and pictorial highlights to embroideries, book plates, and logotypes. Thank you for your attention. So now it is the time for us to start the discussion. And firstly, I would like to thank all the speakers of this session for your very interesting and very different uh, presentations. As we started from the Renaissance book publishers in Krakow, the formation of the title pages of printed books, and then we turned into the modernism times, uh, to the Marx Ernst books, and finished with an overview of the early 20th, 20th century Baltic art represent, rep representations. And I think that all those presentations are linked by two issues. Firstly, the connection between the text and image, which, as we see, was actual since the very beginning and is uh, and still remains actual. Uh, and secondly, the impact of uh, examples of the past to the nowadays book design decisions. And now I have uh, quite many, I think, of questions to the speakers, and I would suggest to start from the first uh, presentation of Joanna and to ask her two questions, maybe to join them into one, as both of them ask about how many books published in Krakow in the discussed period still remain all over the world. And the second one asks how many copies of the first edition of the Schaffenberg Bible have survived and how did the, their illustrations affected other editions of the Bible? Well, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, for the um, opportunity to participate at that uh, conference and once again express how, um, let's say, I'm impressed by uh, organization of uh, this conference. So everything was flawlessly organized. Um, and then uh, Moving on to the question and answer, I'm afraid that my answers will be a little disappointing, especially uh, to, uh, to Rasa, because uh, without uh, notice left uh, in the National Museum, uh, which is now inaccessible, uh, I can't answer exactly how many numbers of the Bibles uh, survive. But maybe it will be uh, worth uh, noting that uh, the stock of this Bible was uh, for sure quite eminent, uh, measuring from the uh, number of the woodcuts cut uh, out from the Bible, which um, really survived. So this may be a kind of answer for the first two questions. And then the question about the, let's say, um, influence of these um, illustrations, um, I would gladly uh, invite um, you to the um, database, which is now available um, at the website at the Institute of Art uh, History at the Warsaw University, um, the database uh, entitled Urus 
which is dedicated to uh, reception of the uh, woodcut production, especially woodcut production of Krakow, and showing uh, exactly how uh, influential uh, this uh, production was and how many, let's say, we can uh, trace many, uh, many uh, reflections of these woodcuts in the uh, 16th century uh, production, not only in Krakow, but also in other, um, in other circles and also abroad. So maybe this will be a, a short answer uh, to, to the post questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And one more question is about what are the main visual features to distinguish books published by Krakow editors in the European context? Um, to be honest, it's difficult to uh, indicate uh, even several features uh, which can be um, indicated as a characteristic for the um, central of Printing such as Krakow was because uh, of its um, relation with other uh, printing uh, printing uh, centers. To be honest, I uh, in my research I trace uh, relationships with other printing centers. So I see the Krakow uh, rather with the connection with other centers, uh, which, which is not a subject very well uh, analyzed in now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your answers. And then now a few questions for Bartolomeo. First of them is, were there any examples of title page creation? Maybe you know what you relied on most often. Uh, yes, the history of the title page was first reconstructed um, on the basis of preserved copies. And um, as I said, uh, the most important work uh, discusses this, this process uh, is a book uh, written by uh, Margaret uh, M. Smith. Uh, the title page is early development from uh, 1460 to uh, 1510. And because uh, I was talking about uh, the um, uh, publishing advertisemental cycle, I can also uh, show uh, the cover of this book and maybe better to recognize it. And um, as I said, uh, the first title card yes, was probably pro protective car. Uh, it mainly secured uh, the book during transport. Uh, the transport uh, was conducted by barrels and uh, other such like stuff, in which time the text began to be applied uh, to it uh, to indicate uh, what work and what author is covered after it, after this uh, protective card. Uh, the first very simple title pages uh, appeared already in the 60s uh, of the 15th century, and over time, their composition and content uh, begin to resemble uh, more modern uh, solutions. Uh, so um, lots of uh, examples of the first, the oldest uh, title pages are uh, discussed by uh, Margaret M. Smith, and I think uh, it's, uh, the book is really worth it. I hope uh, mm, this answer is enough. Yes, thank you. And the, another question is, could you give please some comments on the possible meaning relations between poetic text and visual framing of it? Yes, uh, as, as for the relationship uh, of the text and the woodcut frame, in which it was concluded, uh, it rather doesn't happen. I don't know examples of epigrams uh, that would correspond to a woodcut frame. At the moment, uh, I can't think of such an example. However, uh, it is very common, uh, as I uh, shown in my presentation, uh, for other types of illustration, especially uh, coat of arms and portraits uh, of authors or images of saints. Uh, already in Inculabula, uh, we find poems placed on the title part under the portrait, yes. And uh, this literary form is often uh, referred to as icon and we know also from other later prints. Uh, and uh, such a compositions uh, of um, portraits uh, of saints, of authors, um, with text corresponding to it, uh, is, are one of the stimulus uh, to a born and emblem book. Thank you, thank you very much. And one You're more welcome. question. Hmm, about uh, 
are the title pages in the first crack of prints different from the other publishing centers in Western Europe? Yes, uh, once again, uh, as, as I said, uh, Polish title cards were firstly modeled on German solutions and they're very uh, similar to German ones. With time, also Italian influences became uh, noticeable. Uh, but what's, uh, what distinguishes them from uh, title cards uh, from other car car uh, countries, I think are stemmata, uh, these uh, poems on coat of arms, uh, which, were, which became a very popular panegyric form in the Polish kingdom and later in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and I think uh, these uh, these compositions, yes, uh, are uh, are very characteristic for uh, Polish and, and Polish Lithuanian type of pages. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I have one more question, which wasn't in the chat. Yes. As as we know later, the books of example of title pages we are published, and do you know if such ones were known for the, for the creators in Poland in the Renaissance period? Uh, excuse me, can you repeat the question once more, please? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, later the book, exam the book examples of title pages, I mean that the, the books of the examples where the, some kind of title pages were yes. published. And uh, do you know if uh, those uh, publishers or creators of title pages of the period about which you are speaking used such kind of example books? Mm, I haven't examined it. Sorry, I, I think I, mm, can't, I don't um, I can't say anything um, okay. interesting <laughs> about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. Thank you. Thank you very, <laughs> thank no you very problem. much. Welcome. And I have one comment about Gabriele's, uh, Gabriele's uh, presentation, which says thanks for a very interesting uh, about uh, about very interesting presentation on Mark Seren's book. And one question for Gabriele: uh, Do you know what were the print runs of Mark Seren's collage novels? Hi. Thank you first for the compliment and hi Katarzyna, nice to meet you in Vilnius, even if it's only digital. Um, the print run differs a lot. Um, there were all in all, there were three collage novels and the first edition of each of these collage novels always was about 1000, but they were reprinted and reprinted and new editions in different languages. And for example, the first German edition of La Femme Sans Tête in the 60s, there was a print run from, uh, of 4,000. And then there was a reprint in the 19th of 2,500. And um, the new editions were always around 2,000. Um, as to the American editions, we don't know the print run. They don't make any, in, they don't give any information. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I would like to say from my side that um, I was very much impressed by the book which you showed us during the presentation, presenting the Marx Ernst books and about the design decisions which were based on Marx Ernst designs. So it was really interesting to know and, and I was impressed about this kind of impact on which you based this, this work. So thank you. And now I have some, some questions for Christiana. First of them is how artists were selected for publishing in JBK, what were the principle of selection? Oh, in this regard, uh, there is something that we know for sure and something that can be only guessed at the moment of research. Uh, first of all, uh, we know that the main sources uh, of uh, artwork were exhibitions, mainly held in Riga, exhibitions of Baltic artists, of decorative art, also of Latvian art, this link can be established, but the process of selection itself uh, remains uh, somewhat mysterious, uh, so that perhaps uh, we are 
archival documents still unknown archival documents or editorial meeting records or something like that that uh, can uh, show more light uh, about the process but it remains just presumption uh, but uh, in the selection uh, important was the association of the artist uh, with uh, Baltic uh, provinces uh, as a place of activity as or a place of descent. They were from Balt the Baltics or uh, working in the Baltics. Mm -hmm. And one more question. Approximately how many articles or publications in the JBK were dedicated to not only Latvian but other Baltic states artists? As I uh, said at the end of my presentation, perhaps this uh, question uh, was uh, raised already earlier. Mm -hmm. The focal area of interest uh, for JBK until the First World War was the present day Latvia and Estonia, mm -hmm. uh, the three Baltic provinces. And uh, uh, in terms of content, we find around 50 50 uh, associated with Latvia and Lithonia, uh, Estonia. Sorry. Uh, but this last issue uh, in the 20s, uh, uh, but already intended to embrace all three Baltic countries. Uh, in a similar way, uh, in a similar proportion. Also to include Lithonia, and if we uh, look through the pages, we find approximately a third of uh, visual material and a third of textual material associated with Lithonia. Mm, so oh, well. that, that was in the last volume of the... The last volume, yeah. already, already during Latvian, uh, Estonian, Lithonian independence. Mm -hmm, yes, and the second, uh, the yeah, further question is, did the JBK editors collaborate with artists from other countries, from, for example, Scandinavian, Polish, Russian, French, English, Italian, or some others? In this editorial aspect, uh, they only collaborated with uh, art artists of Baltic origin living abroad, but not... Uh, artists of uh, other uh, nationalities uh, also not the artists uh, who visited who, who has had their visiting exhibitions in Riga or other Baltic states it was very uh, nation uh, national patriotic a very patriotic uh, um, project uh, they uh, wanted uh, everything to be done by Baltic people by Baltic print shops Mm -hmm. uh, by Baltic designers, uh, by Baltic artists. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And one more question. Could you compare JBK with other art journals published in the late 19th and early 20th century in Germany, Austria, Russia? If it is possible, can you name them? The list would be long, uh, but the main, uh, the principal prototype of the JBK that can be discerned uh, very well is the uh, Jahrbuch der Bildenden Kunst that was published in Berlin uh, mm -hmm. for several years since 1902 and uh, also had a similar predecessor and uh, it is obvious uh, that uh, Baltic editors base very much of this publication on this model uh, to compare with others that we know very well like Miris Kustva and Kunstur Alle and, and many others uh, it is important that this was a yearbook, an annual publication, not a monthly or a quarterly. Uh, it, uh, it had the task of documenting. Uh, it does not uh, include any reviews, any operative reactions to events. In, but uh, it also contains... Uh, uh, important publications about the heritage, not only contemporary documentation, uh, but research of heritage. And uh, it is an important aspect in, in this uh, project. Uh, but there remains uh, perhaps some uh, internal contradiction. Uh, 
because many uh, textual contributions are not uh, directly associated with the rich visual material that is not commented in any way. It remains a very, very important source, uh, but uh, uh, the publishers did not intend to comment on it, uh, to interpret it uh, directly then. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, that was the last question from the audience, but I'm wondering maybe you have uh, any questions to each other or you would like to discuss as people who presented at the same <laughs> sessions? or maybe have some thoughts to share after this this session? If no, then I'm very f thankful for all of you for take, taking this challenge to participate uh, in the conference this way. For us as organizers, is, is, it was a challenge as well, but it was challenging and in interesting at the same time to, to try and maybe it's the way which we can use in, in future, especially with those who can't come for any reasons, but they can join in such a way. And now thank you, thank you very much. And I suppose to see everyone of our audience joining tomorrow, from 10 o'clock in the morning in, I mean, Lithuanian time. And uh, to, uh, tomorrow's conference will be about the contemporary book and about comp contemporary design problems and uh, different problems of uh, contemporary art uh, book body. So thank you very much for participating and see you tomorrow.